Hey, Hardscape pros, get ready to turn adversity into opportunity in 2024 with the Hardscaper Showcase events. Discover cutting-edge tools, new construction techniques, and must-have products that will set you apart from the competition. This year, we're diving deep into pool projects, unlocking secrets to flawless coping installations, addressing drainage challenges, and maximizing value for your clients. You'll also learn how to elevate your outdoor kitchen game. We're talking about streamlining builds, creating multifunctional spaces, and impressing clients with innovative Innovative concepts. Finally, we'll show you how to stay ahead of the curve with the latest design trends. Explore new color combos, patterns, and layout strategies that will leave your clients speechless. Don't miss out on the Hardscaper Showcase events, empowering hardscape professionals to thrive in 2024. Visit events.hardscaper.com and sign up today. You're listening to Hardscape Growth, a podcast for hungry professionals who want to grow their businesses and level up. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the Hardscape Growth Show. I'm your host, Alex from Techo Block, and today we're joined by Cody Cook from Pro Green out of uh, Columbia, South Carolina. Uh, they're one of our Techo Pros, uh, been in the business for uh, quite a few years now. And uh, today we're going to talk about a little bit, a year in review, and kind of uh, how this year was compared to the last few and uh, what. Uh, what Cody may have uh, discovered going through this year and wh- how he's preparing for 2024. Welcome to the show, Cody. Thank you for having me today. Very excited to have you on. We met, uh, well, we, we bump into each other every year at Showcase yep. and uh, extended the invitation, but uh, it took me a while to actually circle back and send you a formal one. So happy to finally get this going. Me too. We see every year at Showcase, um, how important because like you're there and if i'm not mistaken you bring a few people of your team too right some years i have i think this year we're going to bring the whole team instead of part of the team so yeah why is that so important for you guys i mean i think it's great to just keep on educating ourselves i'm really big in education and reading and everything um and then also doing that for the guys it's nice for them not to have to be in the field on like a day or two and they get to see you know why we do things the way we do things and also new product, new knowledge. Um, so we can be the next step above our competitors in our market. So education is one of my biggest thing is I think every day we should learn something and continue learning throughout our lifetime. I agree with you. What's the, uh, is there, a particular thing that comes to mind when I say showcase that maybe you guys learned or started implementing because you discovered it there and has it had a significant impact on your business? Um, product knowledge is a big one. Um, the first couple of years, obviously being in the business for a while now, we know pretty much, I mean, the type of block is the catalog is just like a Bible to us at this point. I can, we're, curse everything back to you almost. Um, so product knowledge is a big one from the beginning. And then the second one is just different methods of building like hybrid bases and open graded bases. I know it was a big push a couple of years ago and that's what we've turned into is doing and why we do it and educating our guys and our clients why we do hybrid bases versus a traditional dense graded base and then why we would do dense graded base on some projects versus hybrid base as well, um, depending on the project and the scope of work. Cool. Yeah. And I'm sure that had a pretty significant impact just being able to switch that open graded material, reducing the compaction time, reducing the dependency on nice weather. Mm -hmm. I know you don't experience a ton of freeze thaw in in South Carolina, but it's nice to know Mm -hmm. that it won't matter. No, I got to go visit the snow. I'm, uh, we don't really get snow here, but maybe once every other year. And it's kind of like, oh, my gosh, it's snowing. I mean, I have to go skiing and go see the snow if I won't actually see snow a year. I'm like, y'all in Canada, y'all are just <laughs> drowned in snow every year. Yeah. <laughs> it's all right. I like the four seasons personally. Yeah, I do too. I do like the four seasons. We have it. We just don't have it. The streams. They're just different. <laughs> yeah, it's a little bit more mild. I mean, it's probably yeah. 38, 40 degrees outside versus however cold it is there. Oh, well, that's cute. That's like Halloween for us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So um, let's talk about the uh, the year that was, 2023. 
um, just before we started recording, you were saying that it was a um, it was a pretty good year for you, uh, in spite of the the it not being at all like the last few, and yep. um, a lot of your your peers in the industry uh, may not have the same thing to say. So, uh, what made it a good year for you? How do you quantify a good year? And uh, what are some of the things that maybe you noticed that were different about this year versus previous years? Um, so with COVID happening on the last couple of years, I think that took the hardscaping and design build companies to the next level. Um, and it was just so much growth at once. And everyone either got into the business right before or during that, and they didn't really understand business in general. Um, and marketing and actually getting the leads and closing on projects instead of just having everything come to them. So being in business since 2014, I've already knew the market prior to COVID and after and everything. So I know a lot of young guys have gotten into it and they're very, they're freaking out a little bit, but it's, I say it's back to just pre COVID and pre COVID wasn't bad. Um, so we've stayed doing our marketing that we've always done, doing, you know, trade shows. I know a lot of people don't do trade shows these days, but I do them because I'm the only one there. And I see hundreds of clients uh, and they have to see me right when they walk in because I'm the front the front mm-hmm. guy. Um, so we st- stuck to those during COVID and after COVID and those still helped me and st- stuck to our marketing and, you know, following up with clients and just being that person that said, I actually give them the quote and be responsible and communicate is the biggest thing that I see a lot of people lacking in our industry. It's just proper communication and running a company. And uh, once you step yourself apart from that, you end up still getting, you know, the jobs that you need to keep on maintaining everything. Um, I mean, our numbers are probably not exactly where we want it to be um, because COVID was just a, our best record years, but yeah. definitely taking it in it, when we did our planning for this year, we're not like really below our goal. I mean, we pretty much hit our goal for this year and we've learned, you know, we have to keep on relying on the things we relied on prior instead of, you know, just going with the flow and having things come to us Mm -hmm. and actually chase the jobs and, you know, work on the clients and actually communicate a lot better too. And I, I think a lot of people really lack in that. Um, so we're going forward this year, just the same thing we did this uh, this past year for next year. Um, probably doubling down a little bit more on marketing because uh, I know we did a lot less marketing during COVID. So we'll probably run a lot more uh, marketing and have our marketing budget a little higher and then just keep um, doing our quality of work and communication. So then, you know, word of mouth is a big one for us and having client relationships are great for us as well. Okay. And relationships. I'm just rifling through an entire game plan. So I'm trying to keep up with my notes. <laughs> so if I go back uh, about two minutes here, um, you said it's back to pre COVID. Would you say it really is back to pre COVID in terms of the demand or in terms of the scope of projects? Or both, or or neither. Like, what is back to pre-COVID? I feel like the leads are kind of back to pre-COVID. The scopes of projects in our market, being in South Carolina, we're actually one of the fastest growing states because a lot of people mm-hmm. are in the South for plenty of reasons. Mm-hmm. Um, if it's just for weather reasons, political reasons, and family reasons, so we. Tax we get reasons. a lot of tax reasons. Um, mm-hmm. We get a lot of people from out west and up north that comes here and sells their house up there and then buys something equivalent to that at a fraction of cost. So they end up doing a lot of uh, projects on the outside because they're used to it up north versus the mm-hmm. south. So in our market, we still see those clients coming in. They're being a little bit more picky now because um, back you know, a year or two years ago, I mean – it was hard to even get someone to show up at your house. Some clients would tell me. Yeah, absolutely. And now they're, instead of getting one bid, they're getting two or three bids. Sometimes uh, we try, you know, to mainly be that guy that they don't 
won't even call someone after we show up. Um, so I've seen the numbers like on our um, gross coming in this year is pre-COVID uh, on our growth. And I see our growth uh, for next year is probably going to be back up higher with some of the things that we're implementing in our business and the growth that we're, you know, doubling down. I know a lot of guys are trying to scale down or kind of get to a norm and I'm taking the opportunity to grow instead of just maintained at this point, instead of a lot of guys did a lot of growth in COVID and then now they have to scale down because they don't have the work to actually keep that yeah. up. Yeah, I think the, the yeah. there's a few things, right? If I if I look at your business as a as a business case specifically, because uh, I've been following you on Instagram, and paying attention yeah. to your business basically since I met you, because I, I I saw what you were doing. I'm like, okay, this guy this guy should be should be moving pretty quickly over the next coming years based on what he's doing. And um, I think the the real thing is you were marketing when you didn't have to. And what that was doing was allowing you to capitalize on the situation uh, greater than what others were able to do. And what mm -hmm. I mean by that is, you know, even during the last few years, you still had that exodus of people from northern states coming down south. Um, and this is true, not just in, in South Carolina, it's true in North Carolina, it's true in Tennessee, it's true, true, true in Georgia. I mean, uh, you pick a state that's in a warmer climate and you have boomers leaving from the North and coming down South. Yep. Uh, it's warmer. It's nicer. There's less taxes. It's a little bit easier. It's a little bit slower pace. I'm going to do it. You know? Um, so what you were doing was you were able to capitalize on the fact that people are able to sell their house. Like you said, move into a house of equivalent overall value at a lower price point, giving me more cash to invest so I can do something that's a lot nicer than I could have done back home or even than I was anticipating doing. But what I need is someone who's going to be in front of me, who's going to be inspiring me with all the other things I could do that I wasn't considering initially. Exactly. You marketing into the, into the market, do it, posting the types of work, uh, types of projects that you're doing through social media, going to things like, like um, I call them home shows. You're calling them trade yeah. shows, but basically you're going there to meet, potential homeowners as a tradesperson. So you have your booth. I know that you work together with your local rep to have like the Techo Block trailer as part of your booth and then build this patio setup with a fire feature, a water feature. You're making people think and dream and you're inspiring them to really do something cool and have you come out and check it out. Uh, those are the things that helped you be pickier with the customers and grab the nicer jobs, which in turn enhances your portfolio, enhances what you're posting online, which in turn makes you more appealing to the higher end client. And now that things are kind of slowing down a little bit, you've, and you mentioned word of mouth, you've mentioned relationships, you've established those keys where you've built a brand, you've built a reputation associated to that brand, you have created word of mouth in the right communities, You've built relationships with the right types of people in those communities. So now, while people are kind of dialing it back, you're ramping it up because you can, because you've, you've done the work beforehand. So that's, that's, and that ties into the other thing where you said, like, you're pretty much matching, like hitting the goals that you planned for last year. That's what happens when you have a plan and you work that plan. It puts you in that position where... You know, all the pieces fall into place because it's a long-term vision. It's not a, a survival mode of like, let's just get through the next month or let's just get through the next quarter. Exactly. And that's what I've always focused on. It's like you have to plan, you know, months in advance, even years in advance sometimes to run a business. And a lot of people get into this business and they, you know, they go to project to project and they focus on their project and then, by the time they're finished with that project, they might have another project coming up. Who knows? Because they don't spend enough time actually growing their business. I see a lot of people in our industry also, the ones that can grow, get out of the op like the day to day building and actually mm -hmm. more the designing and you know back end of the office and you know actually being the brand of the company and stuff. And so is that what you're doing now? That's uh yeah. I mean, I really don't. 
I mean, I still go out to all of our projects on a daily basis, uh, quality check and, you know, step in and check on the guys and make sure, you know, the project's going as how need needs to be, see if I need to bring anything to them. But I'm really not out there actually performing the labor. Um, you'll see me out there sometimes doing that. I'll get my hands dirty and do that because I know that I can. Uh, and I trained all my guys and I've trained, I just trained three new guys this year. Um, because of different things that happened in our business early this year, um, from not having a business partner now, um, and not having some of the guys that I had last year. So I know how to train people and that's kind of my skill set is trying to train and lead. And I see a lot of people out there trying to be a leader instead of a trainer and that's fine. But if you don't have this skilled labor and you can't train them, it's hard to lead them as well. And I see that, uh, some people struggling in that as well. Hmm. And trying to be a leader instead of a trainer, what does that mean to you? Um, I see a lot of people just trying to lead a team that's not producing the way that they they should, and it's hard to lead someone and tell someone how to do something if you're not going to actually be able to show them how to do it and actually train them and spend the time with them. You know, every once you're, I mean, I had to train a whole new team this year. Uh, believe it or not. And I mean, I sat in there and stayed with them during the grind to be able to be doing stuff that I'm doing now where I don't have to be on job sites. So you have to lead them as an example, show them how to, your, what your quality, what's your expectations on your projects, because it's, at the end of the day, it's your name and your company that mm -hmm. you're standing behind. So you want your guys to have value to that too, because they want to be bought into what your vision is. A lot of people don't they show their visions as themselves, but not as your whole team. And like when I communicate about stuff that we have, it's a, we, it's not me. It's ours, not mine. I don't like to say stuff that it's mine, even though it's ours as a team. And a lot of people I think struggle with saying a lot of their stuff and they're doing it instead of you're growing a team and a culture. Why is that so important to you? And at what point did it become so important to you? Um, it's been pretty important to me the last couple of years, definitely this year with a lot of growth, uh, different from having a business partner and having some team members that I no longer have. Um, so knowing that culture and having a team is a really good thing because I can rely on them and they can rely on me as well. And we're doing our vision vision together. I struggled without telling them what our vision was. And you could tell that they didn't really were bought in till I told them what the whole vision was. And then they're like really excited about why we're doing what we're doing and the growth that and direction that we're taking places for everyone to grow as human beings and as a company and a, a team itself. That's split from the partner that uh that you're alluding to is that was that something that occurred before the cementing of the vision that you're speaking about or did you get a clearer vision and realize okay i need to make some changes to make this happen well i got a clearer vision i mean we were in business together for multiple years um and my passion and his passion wasn't lining up the same anymore and uh still great friends and love them to death um but it's hard to have two owners that have different directions and paths and visions and i think we struggled with that a little bit in the years past and we came to a agreement and said hey maybe it's better for i go this way and you go this way and no hard feelings and you know i can chase my dreams and passion and don't have to think I'm dragging you along and vice versa. Uh, you can mm -hmm. chase your dreams and passions and don't uh, have to drag me along. Um, so that was part of the, you know, split of our um, partnership. So it's been good. I mean, at first we've, that started April uh, first was the first day basically, but we had that planned, you know, from actually mm -hmm. 22 um, okay. so phased into it. It wasn't like a, one day we're done kind of Rip thing. Rip the bandaid off kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. So it, it was very planned out, no hard feelings, no arguments, no yelling or screaming like a lot of people think. 
Um, <laughs> it's like, no, none of that happened. It's like, we, I can still call him right now and he can still call me and stuff like that. Um, so it's nothing bad about that, but my dream and vision was to grow the company a lot bigger and in different directions than how he wanted to. And it could be because I'm a young guy, not married, no kids. And he's a little older, not that much older, but like seven years older and has two kids and a wife. I mean, it's yeah. a lot of, different what i could put into a, business. a different stage different. in his life yeah. and yeah yeah so, no i mean it makes sense it makes sense i mean it, it doesn't mean that that's what you have to do when you get to that point but you know it it, it is a legitimate reason yeah exactly this episode is brought to you by hardscaper.com the hardscaper mission is to empower industry professionals with the skills inspiration and confidence they need to take their businesses to new heights Struggling with training programs for your team? Looking for helpful tips to build a better company? Subscribe today to gain access to hours of interactive on-demand hardscape construction and business courses for free. Check out hardscaper.com. So what is your vision then? Uh, so our vision for 2024, um, we're going to actually build pools in, uh, in-house. We just signed a contract with a manufacturer of a heavy structure concrete pools called Dejoyo pools out of France. Uh, really cool system, how they have it, their patents and everything different than any other pool um, at a very reasonable price. And we can do 80 to 99% of everything in house other than electrical and gas work um, for obviously licensing reasons. Um, so our visions doing that with all our design builds, and also we're building a showroom and a display he uh, here at the shop wow. on our actual location. And we've run through this whole display so clients can actually come to us. That was one thing that I've seen a couple guys where they have clients kind of come to them, to their garden centers or their showroom and displays instead of us really go. I mean, we still have to go to them, but them coming out here, checking out product selection going over designs, going over options and seeing stuff in person. I've seen a lot because a lot of our clients, you know, when they're spinning over six figures in their backyard, you it's a transfer of trust no matter what mm -hmm. in sales. So I always give them an option. Hey, let's, if you would like to go visit some of our past job sites, I would love to spend the day or a couple hours with y'all and we can hop around. Uh, and see some job sites just so you can see the quality products and stuff like that. Obviously, mm -hmm. let me know my clients, hey, is it okay for us doing that? I have about dozens of them that love it every time we do that. If So instead of doing <laughs> yeah, that. Yeah, if they're spending that kind of money, yeah, I'd, yeah. I'd expect they're, they're eager to show it off. Yeah. So instead of us always going out to projects, I want them to come here, look at you know, the type of pools that we're installing, look at all the techo block displays that we have uh, designed, all the products on the ground, different colors, textures, you know, modern to rustic, and just actually have a whole design center is our goal. So that's uh, what's in the works this uh, coming beginning of this year. So we're hoping to have everything done and open by March 1st is our goal. Uh, so it's going to be a fun one to hit that deadline. Yeah, no kidding. Do you think the um, having people come to your showroom is going to remove the part of your whole sales experience, which is taking people to see completed projects and satisfied customers? Um, I think it will. Mm -hmm. I think some people might still want to see some projects, and I would be open to that. But I think it would set us apart because if you in our market – there's not really anyone that has a show showroom or displays other than our suppliers. Okay. I mean, we've even built the Teku uh, block uh, display at one of our suppliers itself. Mm -hmm. And we, that is a big tool too, to product selection. Whenever clients don't, are hard to actually select product through like catalogs or pictures. So you always have that one or two clients that really want to see it in person, even mm -hmm. if they have a design and everything. Um, so having that will set us apart and show that we're invested into this and we're not like just some people with a truck and equipment that you'll see maybe in a year or two still in business. Um, 
with us giving warranties of five to 10 year warranties on a lot of our products and installs, I mean, we want them to feel comfortable saying they can come to our door because we're open to the public. Mm -hmm. But we have a displays. Um, a lot of pool comp pool builders don't even do that. There's, I think, one pool builder in our entire area that has a display pool in a whole 50 mile radius. So you're looking at the market, you're looking at who you're competing with, and you're trying to find a significant differentiator. And this is one of the ways that you can do it. Yep. And it's building off of the success that you've had with trade shows or home yep. shows because that works. So why not have that 365 days a year instead of just for a week is basically exactly. what you're thinking. Yep. Because we do, I mean, a lot of trade home shows – a lot of clients that are moving from Florida, New York, California, out west, um, they come to those home shows because they don't know anyone. They mm -hmm. don't have relationships here unless they have some family members that live here. So word of mouth is really hard to get to them. They'll and then most of our clients here recently are, you know, they're gonna be in their fifties to about seventies because they're more into the retirement age. So some of them are not very tech savvy and they don't want to go online and find someone. They want to know that person in person. Um, so I've seen those trade shows. A lot of people are like, they're dying, they're dying. But for us, our ROI on them are so well, it's like, it's hard not to do them. Like sometimes I'm like, oh, I don't want to set up a booth. But like at the end of the weekend, I'm like, I'm glad we're here. What's um, it cost you when you do a show? Um, We've negotiated our shows really well. Um, mm -hmm. So landscapers and hardscapers normally get discounts for the booths because we're building. You need bigger space. booths and you're building and cool need, stuff to check out. Yeah. So you're adding always, value to the show. I yeah, think it's important, eh? Like I, I, I met landscapers that like they're paying full of pop and I met others that understand what they're bringing to the table like you. And yeah. it makes a difference at the end of the day on your cost. Exactly. So uh, we get a 20 by 30 booth. So that's pretty much the biggest they will give you. Unless that's you a good size, man. Bigger. Yep. Um, we've started with a 20 by 20, we get the front door. Um, and I think that would go for about four or $5,000 for a regular business. We pay about either a thousand to 1500 bucks. Um, and then obviously so it costs you for the space and then you have yeah. materials and your time materials and time. Um, yeah. so, I mean, it, it is an investment. There's, I mean, every time, every year we're always negotiating it down because we always bring value to them and they always want us to be there because no, a lot of home shows are very commercialized sometimes. Mm -hmm. So them seeing product and uh, seeing really nice displays built, they like to see that. So they incentivize us to come back and come back. So it's all about negotiating your own terms. And uh, you, I mean, you said the ROI without getting into like exact percentages, but what, what's the typical outcome when you're doing the, the, the show? Are you getting, Two, three, four jobs, uh, more, less. So on the shows, we it's a great way to weed through the tire kickers and clients itself because you see them in person. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm very picky about setting up appointments with people. Um, and we set up appointments at the show. We'll schedule them at the show whenever they're actually serious, ready to go. Normal, normal shows, we've done 25 to about 15 appointments per show. Is wow. what we do. You mean um, you're setting up appointments as a result of the show, or you're setting up appointments with people who've contacted you, like come see us at the show, we'll sit down and we'll we'll walk through it. No, that's them coming to the show. Okay. Um obviously we try to uh whenever I'm doing appointments weeks prior is like, hey, come see us at the show too to see product. Mm -hmm. Um try to bring people to the show outside of the show, just bring them to us. Yeah, make so sure you're still closing some business while you're there, even if the show's quiet. Yeah. And I've done that. Uh, handful yeah. of time. I was like, Hey, I got this product that we're actually going to be showing at the show. Come mm -hmm. check it out. See if you like that. And if you do, let's sign the contract there. I've done that actually more than a couple of times. Yeah. Um, so that well, even strategically, like it, it projects an image of, of demand coming yep. into your booth, right? You have people showing up for an appointment. They're signing paperwork in the booth. Like I'm walking yep. by, I'm like, what's going on here? Like yep. maybe I should stop and talk to this guy. Exactly. And that's, yeah. it's really nice. And having those, you'll see a lot of people come to the shows every single time. And those are, a lot of those become your clients. Mm -hmm. So they're always stopping in and like thanking you. And some of them are like, Hey, by the way, I got another project coming up. 
So mm-hmm. when you, other people see a lot of reaction in your booth, they always want to have a little bit in, in that reaction too. So it's yeah. just been a great thing that I've fell into about five plus years ago. I mean, we did it prior to COVID and did all the stuff during COVID and it's just been really good for us. So I enjoy it because I get to speak with clients and talk to them, set up appointments at the show. And then we have clients that call us a year to two, three years later and set up appointments because we hand out yeah. apps and, uh, brochures and I have them literally keep it on their refrigerator there. And I asked them, Hey, where did you hear about us? And they're like, Oh yeah, I saw you at the show like two years ago. And I'm like, you kept this little brochure for two years and there's, yeah, it's been on the refrigerator. I was like, see, it works. Like you just never know. Yeah. Really. It's hard to track it a hundred percent because you don't know what show you have to then dial down. What show exactly did you do? So we were doing like four a year. Yeah. Um, so what show did you actually come to two years ago? But you're going to where the people are, I think is the, yeah. the main takeaway. Yeah. Do, what other things do you do for marketing? Um, that's what we've been doing a lot the last three years. Because during COVID, like everyone else, we didn't do a lot of online marketing. It wasn't needed. Um, mm-hmm. Obviously, we have our own website or generating leads off of our website organically. We haven't done any paid ads on social media or paid ads on like Google and stuff the last three years. Um, that's something that we're going to end up probably doing more Facebook ads here shortly, definitely for like the pools and uh, design builds that we're going to be doing. So we're going to probably be running more Facebook ads, maybe some Google ads as well. It's the other marketing that we're going to be implementing for this coming year. And um, is there, have you already established the budget for that? Uh, we've been, wor- we're still working on exactly the numbers of the budget. Mm-hmm. Uh, Cause we're trying to budget, uh, budget the displays and stuff in there into, you know, I feel like that's more of a marketing uh, budget too. So we're still trying to work out all the kinks between our budget on there. But most likely, we're going to spend at least a thousand to two thousand dollars a month on uh, online ads. Is what our goal is. All twelve months. Um, most likely because our season's year round here. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, we're still working today. We're going to get off a little early today for Christmas, and then we'll be back at it uh, after Christmas for a couple of days, and then off for New Year's, and we'll be right back at it after new year's. I mean, we don't really take a break other than the holidays. So work, we can work year round. The only thing that really stops us is the rain here. We don't see snow. We don't really see anything really below 20 degrees here. So we have free stall. So you're going. Yeah. So a lot of people slow down during the marketing on the uh, winter time because people are not spending as much, but I see maybe people might not be signing the deals during this time of the holidays, but they're planning, they're designing, they're getting ready. And Mm -hmm. you have to educate your clients. If you want this, like I was talking to a client, if you want to swim by May, we need to start by February because there's no way for me to get you swimming by May. If you're not starting way early, I can't Mm -hmm. start May 1st and you'd be swimming May 31st. Uh, It's not going to happen. Yeah. So educating your clients, your backlog, you get backed up so many months or so many weeks that you need to book ahead of time and have, you know, not creating that demand, but letting them know that the demand's there. If you want this sooner than later, we need to, you know, get on this process. So speaking of that timing, what's the typical length of time from a lead to a shovel in the ground? Uh, depending on the project, um, if it's a big design build, it could take three months till we get there. At one point, we were eight to nine months out at one year. I mean, that was really tough uh, going through that just because you have to tell clients before you meet with them, hey, we're six to eight months out before we can even come there to dig in the ground. If that's okay, we can go ahead and do your appointment. If that's not, we apologize. We can refer you someone else or you can find someone else. Um, this past year, we've been pretty steady about, about a two or three month out book. Um, and the years past, we normally stayed around three to four months. So So three is a good number for you. Yeah. Threes. I like, that's always been our number is two to three months out prior to COVID. 
and that makes me feel a little bit comfortable. It still makes me, you know, I have to keep on working. I can't just, uh, we're eight months booked out. I'm going to just sit back and relax kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Um, a lot of people took that and said, Hey, you should double down and double do another crew. And I said, uh, I could, but I don't know if that demands it to continue a year down the road. I don't want to make sure I'm able to keep that scale versus have to, I would hate to have to let go three guys and reduce equipment and stuff like that. If we couldn't keep that scale. So that's why I want to take this year and actually grow versus take a year. That's not normal and grow from a non normal. Yeah. year. No. Well, I think that's a cautious approach because you, you saw what it was before and now it feels similar to then. So like that's, you, you have some experience with it. So you want to see it play out a little bit, try some things and then, then, you know, okay, we're ready to take another step. And it's, it's actually what we're doing that's driving the growth and success, not we're riding a wave and yep. you know, it's, it's, these are external factors that could go away. Exactly. That's good. It makes sense. Uh, let me go back to the uh, my notes here and just look at the um, – yeah, the other thing I wanted to talk about was you, you said proper communication is a big differentiator in running a business. Um, what do you mean by that? Uh, communication, expectations to clients and the same okay. thing with your team as well. I mean, I feel like you have to communicate with your team members and put those expectations of – them communicating back to you. Um, like my big thing is I might not be at the job site to the end of the day. I require one of my guys to, in our text message feed to send me pictures of the progress for the end of the day. That is a requirement. That is communication. If for some reason you can't come in because you're sick, some reason that something happened, I want a 24 hour notice minimum, unless it was emergency and you need to communicate that. I don't want to be, you not show up that morning. And I, now I have to adjust because I only have three guys versus four guys. Um, so communicating within the team and telling them, communicating with them, saying the reason why I need this communication is so we work as a team. This is not an individual thing. It's a team effort. So when you don't show up, the team has to work harder because of that. And if you don't tell me that you don't show up, then we have to move things around to be able to actually do what we need to do sometimes, some days. Mm -hmm. um, and then with the clients wise is communicating with them what your process is. So on a lot of uh, jobs we go out to and look at and, you know, we require a design on some projects that we do because you have to have a design to build something that they're trying to visualize and I'm trying to visualize maybe my vision is different than their vision. And I always tell them I want to be on the same page and design exactly what you want and what I recommend. So then when I'm digging up, digging in your ground, we know exactly what you're going to get at the end of the day and what you're going to be paying for versus you might be clueless of what you're getting. If you're going to spend, you know, tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousand dollars in your backyard, would you not want to know exactly where you're getting? Like you don't go buy a car blindless. Um, you go test out, test, drive a car before you buy it. Mm -hmm. Same thing with a design is it's basically a test drive of your backyard. You walk through it, you see every angle, every feature, every color texture, because you're test driving your backyard of the future. I, I haven't heard it referred to that way, but it makes a lot of sense. It's yeah, I mean, it's just something I've always told clients is a necessary majority of the time on design builds. I mean, design builds is definitely necessary. Not every project needs a design because I it's very simple cookie cutter, you know, mm -hmm. on the small end of projects. We don't need a design for that. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes we don't need a 3D rendering. Maybe we just need a 2D layout um, and just, you know, communicating with your clients about that process and, you know, their expectation of when they're going to get their design, when they're going to get their quote, when you're going to actually show up. I don't tell clients one thing we've learned in the past years prior is when we do appointments, I like to do a 30 minute to an hour window on arrival, not because I will, don't want to show up on time. You never know when traffic happens. You mm -hmm. never know when, oh crap, we got to get going and you're five minutes late. You look bad showing up five minutes late versus showing up within that 30 minutes to hour window because you're still on time. I'm very, you know, if it's a 10 a.m., 10 to 8, 
10 to 11 a.m. appointment, I want to show up at 555 if I can, but I never know if I get stuck in a wreck. Right. So then you don't have to call the client and explain, hey, and then they're always, from the get, they're always upset. And the, yeah. you did not meet their expectations. Um, so that's part of communication. Uh, and same thing with, you know, rev- giving them the quote and the process of that, you know, explaining that and communicating with them. And then same thing with getting on the schedule. We go project to project. So I can tell you, you know, about a time frame when we're going to start, you know, when we're getting closer to that time frame that I tell you like, hey, we're going to start the second, the third week of February. I'm going to communicate basically February 1st about clo- exactly when we're going to be coming in, plus or minus a day or two, just so they understand, you know, you're in a waiting line, basically, and you're. I'm not telling them I'm going to show up at February 15th, and then I'm delayed because of weather on the project mm-hmm. prior to them, and I have to show up at February 18th. They're already mm-hmm. upset at that point, even though some majority of people understand, but you're you their expectation was different than what you relate to them communicating was. Yeah, well I think the the big key is even if it seems like obvious things to people in the industry, mm-hmm. the homeowner has no idea and a lot of people um that you're dealing with in in a market like that uh it might be like it's probably 50-50. I mean actually I'll I'll ask the question but I would assume it's probably fifty fifty. You have clients more of the cookie cutter jobs, those are probably the first time they're doing this type of thing. And then the you know, the full design build is probably the second or third time they they've gone through this journey. So they they know what to expect, but they're still probably half your business that they don't know. So you have to be crystal clear, like this is what's gonna happen now. Because yeah. otherwise they start making up their their own mind on things. Exactly. And then I mean I tell my clients it looks like a bomb that went off in their backyard half the time. Yeah. And it's it's like baking a cake. You're not going to put your finger in that cake when it's in the oven um, to the icing's on it. So like it's baking a cake. You're going to see the process of building a cake basically in your backyard. And please don't really bother that process of building a cake till the finished icing is done. Yeah. And that's when we can say, all right, we need to look address these issues versus trying to address issues that we haven't got to yet. Yeah. And you have to rely that to a customer because there's some customers that we've dealt with every day. We're talking about stuff and I'm like, Mr. Mr. Whoever, uh, it's like, you almost said a name. (laughs) I'm trying to be, I I, I could say his name and he wouldn't care because he knows I've said this to him and it's like baking a cake because you're looking at something that's not done yet. It's not a finished Mm -hmm. product. Um, same thing with almost building a house. I mean, you're, you don't see the finished product yet. You're not going to talk bad about the drywall when the drywall is not fully sanded down and, you know, right. finish, um, as, as long as it's leveled. Um, but you have to walk them through the process. Like yesterday, I was, we're looking at building a pool and a do a whole outdoor build out there. And I tell them like, Hey, expecting your, it's a mountain of dirt coming out. It's going to be a bomb in your backyard. Just don't even look in your backyard for, you know, couple of weeks mm-hmm. um, take a vacation take a vacation like it and they they're like oh app, we we know that for sure our parents got a pool okay and did all this outdoor living space okay you understand some people don't understand that they think it's like going to be pretty throughout the whole process and it's not like that it's yeah we're destroying your backyard and you, you have to tell them that basically in a nice way it's like we're going to destroy your backyard but by the time we're finished it's going to be the best backyard you can get Good. I like the, uh, the clarification there. Okay. Well, uh, listen, is there anything that you want to add in terms of, uh, what you're, what you're seeing or what you're planning for next year or any lessons that you learned this year that you would share with, uh, with our audience before we wrap up here? Uh, lessons, um, that we've learned this year is just continue doing what you've always done in the past. Uh, definitely prior to COVID, just continue doing your traditional stuff that worked and stay steady with that instead of just hoping that things happen and just keep adamant at running a business and creating your leads and selling jobs. You have to, you know, stay at it instead of letting it come to you. Um, We learned that lesson. I mean, we know, knew how to do it prior and we made sure we kept on doing it. Um, I think a lot of people are learning that in the industry now. 
that I've seen a lot of young guys get in and now they're either slowing down or getting out, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. On form. The consistency of effort is really what you're saying. Yep. The things that are working well, keep doing them consistently and that compounds over time and if you keep building and perfecting and optimizing well the business gets easier to run and it grows faster exactly cool all right well thank you very much for joining us on the show uh it's gonna be uh, great to run into you at the uh charlotte i guess you'll, you'll show up at the charlotte or the durham uh, showcase this year yeah i'll be at the charlotte one i might right. know who knows who <laughs> knows done. So I'll see you and your crew there. And uh, until next time, everyone. Oh, actually, and if, if people who are listening, if you want to sign up for Showcase, you can go to events.hardscaper.com. It's a free event. This year, we are talking about pools. Uh, so that, that that fits really well for, for the next phase of your business. Everything you need to know to build proper pool decks, make sure that that coping sticks on, regardless of the type of pool, the type of coping, what are the different mortars, different adhesives you can use, how to make sure you have the right waterproofing joint behind the coping, which is a step a lot of people are skipping, proper drainage, uh, cleaning and protecting of the pool decks. Uh, we have all that stuff and a bunch more. Uh, happening at your local Hardscaper Showcase event. So make sure to check that out. And uh, until next time, everyone, work hard, pave harder. Thank you, Cody, for joining us on the show. And uh, we'll see you next week on the Hardscape Growth Show. You've been listening to Hardscape Growth, a podcast for hungry professionals who want to grow their businesses and level up. Each episode is all about taking the next step in running your business. So make sure you never miss a show by subscribing on your favorite podcast player. And if you're finding this information to be useful, help others in your position discover us by giving us a star rating and leaving a comment. We'll see you next week.